Deep within the cold northern mountains of Ilzebard, a martial champion strode confidently into his tent. His tribe had successfully raided another one of the small Garlean settlements, and he could hear his followers toasting his name and boasting about their stolen goods from afar. He thought he was safe. He thought he could relax. He thought about what they might take next. What he did not think was to ask why the inside of his tent was so much colder than normal. And he didn't feel something was wrong until after he heard what sounded like a gasp in the air. He spun on his heel to meet the noise, only to find nothing there. Now alert, he reached for his weapon, but discovered that as his fingers wrapped around the hilt, he had no strength to grasp it. His strength had fled, making him fall to his hands and knees, wondering what sort of trickery this was. Was he poisoned? Perhaps a spell? His mind raced, only to come to an immediate halt as a spindly hand with long, monstrous fingers entered his peripheral vision. That god-forsaken noise rasped in his ear again. Can't run. This thing, whatever it was, all his instincts screamed that it was to blame for sapping his strength. He wanted to yell, to warn the others, but his breath was short and the air stung like shards of ice in his throat. His focus was shattered as he heard a pair of footsteps emerging from a dark corner of the room. Whoever they were, they were behind him. He couldn't see. He couldn't face them. All he could hear was the sound of a heavy metal mechanism snapping into place, and the long, gruesomely sharp blade of a scythe came down to wrap itself around his neck. And the voice, that awful, awful voice, it was laughing at him. The scythe's wielder, having made their decision, quietly brought their weapon back and preparing their strike. This fighter, this champion of his tribe, for the first time in a long time, quaked with fear. And with the last of his strength, he finally spoke. Wait! Good day, my friends. In the many topics and disciplines we've discussed over time, I've always found it interesting how the slaying of one's enemies is often a byproduct of their true reason for existing. A defender only slays to protect what they value. A hunter only claims life so that they can survive. And even the pious might defeat someone or something just to prove that they can. But what if death was the discipline's reason for existing. What if to walk this path is to know for certain, whether for good or evil, lives will end? What if the sanctity of morals, justice, and spiritual purity meant nothing as a bloody path was carved? Well then, those people may be walking on the road we'll be discussing this very moment. Gather around, my friends, for today we'll be sure to check every shadow and whisper on the wind. For today, we'll discuss what it means to be a Reaper. While the ways of the Reaper aren't among the oldest of traditions, they have still existed for centuries. And to truly understand their origins, we need to turn back the clock all the way to the 800s of the Sixth Astral Era which is a little more than several hundred years ago. This was when the Garlean people as we know them were steadily exiled from the provinces of southern Ilsebard and were forced to migrate into the cold and unforgiving climes of northern Ilsebard. This was a dangerous and deadly time for the Garlean people to be sure, but they were resolved to survive no matter what. And in spite of it all, the Garleans did in fact start to build communities for themselves, and over time, created modest farmlands with which they could sustain themselves. That was until their steadily growing towns were noticed by the wandering tribes and clans that would tour northern Ilsebard. 
Indeed, they weren't the only people who called the more dangerous parts of this continent home. And since important resources like food were often scarce, those tribes would raid the early Garlean towns for what little they had, making survival all that more difficult. Garlean history will tell you a variety of ways in which their people would use ceruleum to keep warm, or how they would hire mercenaries to help protect their land. But there's a slice of history that isn't well known to every Garlean, and that is how some of them will give in to their darkest desires, to see their foes broken and butchered before them, and how they would pay any price to see that happen. They called for blood, and the void heard them. Now, small void portals or tears between the Source and the 13th aren't unheard of, but as it turns out, the fabric between our realm and the void was surprisingly thin in some sections of northern Ilsebard in particular. So, when these wrathful farmers cursed and raged against their misfortune, something heard them. The intense emotions and disdain radiating from their ether was intoxicating. And so, after picking up the scent, voices from the dark began calling out to them. What these voices offered was power. Power to take back what was theirs. Power to strike fear into any foe. Power to kill and kill and kill to reap a harvest not of the ground and earth, but of blood and souls. These Garleans would give in to the temptation offered by the voices, and as the pact was made, the first reapers walked upon the lands of Ilsebard. The bargain was simple. In exchange for the powers offered by the demonic void scent, the reapers would strike and slash and slay. Through bloodletting and death, Aether is released, and it's that same Aether that the Reaper's partner would partake of with a ravenous appetite. The Void Scent would be satisfied in knowing that their endless hunger for Aether would be quelled for a time, and in exchange, the Reaper would have dark powers few could ever possess. Wielding their old farming scythes as weapons, the first reapers set about claiming the lives of those who tried to exterminate them. Now, making deals with entities seen as demons wasn't exactly something that the reapers could go around and wear as a badge of honor. So, instead of advertising their actions, the reapers began working from the shadows, only appearing when necessary and always taking lives whenever they did show up. As such, the Reapers became ruthless assassins more than anything, killing high-profile targets to sow chaos and ruin enemy morale. Because if they could break the willpower of Garlemald's enemies, then the Garlean people would be able to defeat them that much more soundly later on. This trend became normal for hundreds of years, as the Reapers would appear and kill whatever was threatening Garlemald before retreating back to their home, retreating back to places like Lapis Manalis. The Reapers eventually saw themselves as the silent protectors of Garlemald. However, their bargain with the Void Scent didn't care about protecting the weak, justice, or honor. So long as something was dying, that's all that mattered. However, due to Garlemald's transition to a more Magitite-driven society, as well as betrayal on multiple fronts, almost all the Reapers were wiped out, with their culture of assassins vanishing almost entirely into history. And yet, there are still those who wield the powers and abilities of a Reaper. So, let us discuss those now. We'll start by addressing the biggest catch to being a Reaper, the Pact with their Avatar. An avatar is created when the Reaper in question makes a deal with a Void Scent, often using the Reaper's Soul Crystal as a medium. Once the pact is made, a Void Scent becomes the Reaper's avatar, an extension of their powers and abilities. 
As stated earlier, the Avatar will provide the Reaper with magics and abilities in exchange for the Reaper's commitment to causing death. Death that will release ether that the Avatar can drink from. Garleans cannot use or wield magic because of their biology, but having an Avatar circumvented this issue. Because when a Reaper is using spells and abilities, technically it's not theirs. Those spells belong to and are manifested from the bond with their Avatar. No Avatar, no magic. And since we're dealing with a Void Scent, you can technically file the Reaper's spells under Void Magic specifically. They can fire magical projectiles, create temporary barriers, or even teleport short distances. And that's not even addressing the wide variety of offensive spells and abilities that the Avatar itself will unleash upon command by the Reaper to do so. However, there's something very important to note, my friends. A Reaper cannot make a pact with just any Void Scent to become their Avatar. Traditionally, in order for the Reaper to fight at their full potential, the Void Scent in question needs to be able to harmonize with them, meaning that the soul of the Reaper and that of the Void Scent need to be uniquely compatible with one another. This has led many to believe that any Void Scent made into an Avatar might in fact be the 13th Sundered Fragment of the Reaper themselves. However, research was quick to point out that not every Sundered Soul of the 13th is available at all times, making this theory completely impossible in a variety of cases. So, for the moment, the theory that a Reaper's Avatar is in truth their 13th Shard remains unverified and unverifiable. But why does the Reaper need to be perfectly compatible with their Avatar? Simple, because the Reaper's own body needs to become a vessel for the Avatar in order for their power to reach its peak. The ability for a Reaper to merge with their Avatar is called Enshroud, and is the pinnacle of a Reaper's training and trust. I say trust because to use Enshroud is to allow the Avatar to join your soul within your body temporarily. Make no mistake, this means that the Reaper's own soul becomes vulnerable to the Avatar's power and influence. They must remain in control and on guard at all times, lest the Avatar be tempted to try and take over their body for themselves as this issue has happened before. It shouldn't come as a surprise though. An avatar is still a void scent, and all void scent are gluttons for ether. If the reaper in question has a weak will or fails to uphold their bargain, an avatar might try to take advantage of them. In fact, it's rumored that even seasoned reapers were prepared to slay their own avatars if ever betrayed. However, if the Avatar is cooperative and the Reaper remains in control during the Enshroud, then the power of two distinct spirits fighting as one allows them to attack with otherworldly power and speed for a brief time. This power even extends into their Limit Break, which has been called the End. To perform this Limit Break, the Reaper joins with their Avatar just like using Enshroud, However, it doesn't stop there. They gather and feast upon the ether of the battlefield in order to deliver a strike so potent it could be the death of almost any opponent. To perform the end isn't for the faint of heart, as it isn't meant to simply wound or warn. The Reaper must be committed to becoming the death of their enemy for this limit break to unleash its full power. Now that we have gone over their history and abilities, it's time to address a Reaper's choice of weapons and attire. As stated earlier, the first Reapers began using their own farming tools as weapons at first. In fact, this is surprisingly normal. History has proven that a variety of weapons began as nothing more than crafting tools or farming implements. However, a scythe is certainly an odd choice. 
Because of its shape and weight, it lacks the ability to thrust or jab like many other weapons. And since the weight distribution is so one-sided, it's not a common weapon at all. But why? Why use such a challenging weapon? Because their deal with an avatar is to be the cause of death, not to leave shallow cuts or big bruises. The scythe may have begun as a farming tool, but over the years, it was changed. The blade was made thicker, the snath was made more durable and easier to grip, and over time, the once humble farming tool became the large and dangerous weapon we see today. The most common attack of a scythe is twofold. First, the reaper is to swing the blade in a way that pierces the target with the tip, creating an opening for the rest of the large blade to follow. Once dug into their target, the reaper yanks back the scythe with great force, causing the extremely sharp edge of the blade to gouge and maim the target on exit. Not only that, but a reaper's scythe is said to be so sharp that if the blade is allowed to reach behind something, like an arm, leg, or even a neck, a swift cleave is all that's necessary to remove that part of the body. A scythe is an all-or-nothing weapon, meant to cause as much damage as quickly as possible. But if a scythe has no defensive properties, then what of their armor? A reaper's attire is meant to complement their offensive attacks, not make up for its weaknesses. Since a reaper's movement will be carried swiftly by the weight of their weapon, their outfit needs to be flexible, so things like heavy plate are completely out of the question. More often than not, reapers will wear some combination of leather and cloth to not only create this flexibility, but also reduce the amount of noise they make. Remember, reapers were originally assassins above anything else. It's asserted that the reason Garlean reapers adopted darker colored outfits instead of a snowy camouflage was to terrify and confuse their targets. If a reaper's outfit was dark and ragged, resembling their avatar, then it would be harder for an opponent to tell where the avatar begins and the reaper ends. This brief moment of confusion might be all the time a reaper needs to land a lethal strike. Not only that, it was proven that some reapers would wear catalysts for void scent summoning on their belts, as well as weave void scent blood into some of their armor to make cooperating with their avatar more seamless. So, what Reaper armor lacks in defense, it more than makes up for with silence and maneuverability. And that brings us to the end of our discussion. If being a Reaper sounds more treacherous than most disciplines, that's because it is. A Reaper must not only make good on their bargain with their avatar, but constantly prove that they are the one in control not the Void Scent. They must learn to harmonize and cooperate with their avatar like a friend, but never forget its nature, lest they fall prey to the most basic instinct of a Void Scent, to feed. To those who walk the path of the Reaper, hear me now. You have chosen a grim task. There is little honor or glory to be gained by conspiring with demons and partaking of their dark pact. But that's fine, isn't it? What good is honor if you're dead? And so often, glory is often given to those who don't even deserve it. No, your path is one of death. And you chose it, willingly. So why not embrace this terrible task and become the death that so many fiends and fools deserve? Oh yes, a new generation of reapers may yet rise, and with them, death will follow, grinning. Thank you all for watching to the end. 
If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and share this with your fellow adventurers? With your help, I'll try to reach out even further and bring even greater stories to you. Although, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my biggest contributors. A grand thank you to Amina Viltaria, Slippers, Potato, Sage Mouse, Sinalv Bagel, Cezani, and Travon Shea, with an additional nod to the scholarships on screen. Links to things like my Twitter and that of my channel artist Caddy can be found in the description. Thank you all for your viewership, as well as your support, and I hope all of you have a wonderful day. Class dismissed.